Mr. President, thank you very much for joining us. Well, today. I'm pleased to be here. The new Soviet leader, Mr. Gorbachev, recently told the American people that we should know that war will never come from the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union will never start a war. Do you believe him? Well, I have to say this, that we need more uh, than just those words. The, I'm, I've always felt that, uh, yes, the Soviet Union would like to achieve some of its goals without war, but that does not mean by eliminating the threat of war. Now, if they really mean this, they'll find that we certainly are prepared to go along with that. And, um, but I think that both of us then must be willing to show uh, our attitude by deed as well as words so that we can have confidence in each other. Both President Nixon and President Ford, interestingly, have said just before you in this broadcast that they don't think the threat of nuclear war really does come from the Soviet Union, that it comes from some third nation as nuclear weapons continue to proliferate. Do you feel strongly that the Soviet Union is still the central character in this? Well, I think we're the two superpowers with the two great arsenals of weapons aimed at each other. But I would have to go along with them that a threat now that the world knows how to make such a weapon will always be that sometime, someplace, there may be a madman in the world who comes along and decides to, to use that weapon. And this is one of the reasons why our strategic defense initiative is so all important. Mr. President, we've heard a lot of history during this broadcast. I'd like to turn you a little in the direction of philosophy, if I may. You don't have a great deal of time to cultivate new philosophies. But is the Ronald Reagan who's sitting there today the same one who spoke of the Soviet Union as being an evil empire? Yes. But I would, I would ask you to think back to some of the things that uh, have happened, such as the shooting down of a passenger airplane with hundreds of passengers simply because it uh, accidentally invaded what the Soviets claim was their airspace. We must recognize that all the statements of Soviet leaders all the way back to Lenin have made it plain that they are dedicated to the Marxian theory of a world revolution and that communism requires one day a one world communist state. I have often quoted Lenin's statement that when he said we will organize Eastern Europe or we will take Eastern Europe which they have. We will organize the hordes of Asia. Well, they tried with China, and at least now they're trying in Cambodia. And then we will move into Latin America, and we won't have to take the United States. It will fall into our outstretched hand like overripe fruit. Well, we've never made any statements like that about them. Confrontation and antagonism between the United States and the Soviet Union. Need it always be thus? Oh, wait. Let me say one other thing. I would prefer the word, the proper word is realism. We have too many times embarked on a program of trying to achieve detente with the Soviet Union and sort of with looking at them in a mirror image as if, we're, if we just appeal to them and say, look, we're nice people and we don't want any trouble and, uh, and why don't you uh, join us? Well, that isn't the way I think it's going to happen and it never did happen. Where are the areas of opportunity, sir? We now have redressed our military capability to the point that the Soviet Union uh, does not have an undisputed superiority of such uh, nature that they could uh, deliver an ultimatum, surrender or die. And the fact that the Soviet Union probably recognizes itself how much more they could do for their people, how much uh, more their economy uh, could develop if they were not engaged in this great build-up of weapons. Is it going to be possible? We've had 40 years of looking at the world through that east-west Moscow-Washington prism, and we have a very hard time looking at individual problems, South Africa, Nicaragua, Middle East, Persian Gulf, and looking at them in their own terms. We've made some mistakes over the past 40 years because of that. And I wonder how it is ever going to be possible for us to get out of that kind of rigid way of regarding the world. 
Well, let me say something else about these 40 years, uh, a little more optimistic nature. If you look back over the history of wars, Europe, the world, World War I, every time peace was made, the peace laid the foundation for the next war. The rivalries, the hatreds, the divisions were not healed. It was like a truce in which everybody stopped shooting but kept on hating. And then came World War II, the greatest of all. And World War II ended, and frankly, the United States took the lead in a settlement that, as I say, said, wait, now it's over. We are going to help those of you who have been wounded so badly in this war. The Marshall Plan, things of that kind. And today, as I say, our strongest allies uh, are our erstwhile enemies. And 40 years, the longest period they've known of peace between us. Now, I say for the next 40 years, let us build on that. The, it is true there has been a kind of confrontational thing with one erstwhile ally, the Soviet Union. But that doesn't mean that we give up, or that doesn't mean we uh, succumb to the idea of the inevitability of conflict. We keep on trying as we're trying in the hope that they too will realize that their system will be better off, they will all be better off, if, like the rest of us, we decide to live in the world together uh, without conflict. And then there could be times in which the Soviet Union and the United States combined could intervene in some of the regional difficulties and some of the minor wars that have started here and there and help bring about a peace. And I believe that all of this is possible. I believe it's probable. And my hope and dream is we're going to start that process, really, uh, in Geneva in November. Mr. President, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir.